Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Potentially good morning. My name is Chris Clegg. I'm a managing editor with the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, and the global editorial lead for trade and globalization. I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, the uphill struggle combating illicit trade in Pakistan. Uh, this is the second event in two weeks that we've done on illicit trade. The event last week was global in nature. This week, we'll be drilling down to focus on the issue uh, in Pakistan. I will interview, or sorry, I will introduce uh, our four panelists in a moment. But first, a few uh, few housekeeping notes. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Philip Morris International, uh, who has sponsored uh, this series of events on illicit trade. Um, there is, uh, for those of you who are joining us, there is a Q&A box. Uh, so over the course of the event, you can ask uh, questions and we will take them as they come in. Uh, there won't be a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event. Uh, I, will, uh, I will pose them to the panelists uh, as appropriate and as, as they come in. Uh, the way that today's session is going to work is uh, after introducing the panelists, I'll give them each about two minutes for some introductory remarks, uh, and then uh, we'll continue the conversation from there. Uh, in addition to the Q&A from all of you in attendance, uh, we'll also be asking you a series of three poll questions throughout the events and using those as a basis for further discussion. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce the four panelists. Uh, First, uh, in no particular order, we have Bjarke Mikkelsen, who's the Chief uh, Executive Officer of Duraz, uh, Roman Yazbek, who's the Managing Director of Philip Morris Pakistan, Asan Malik, uh, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Pakistan Business Council, and Ishrat Hussain, uh, who's advisor to the Prime Minister of Pakistan uh, and a former governor of the State Bank of Pakistan. Um, so with that, uh, with that being said, I would like to start with, uh, with Biake, if you could give us uh, a few introductory remarks about the state of illicit trade in Pakistan and your view, uh, you know, Duraz being an e-commerce and logistics player, how you view the issue. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, so, uh, so, so I've been doing business now in Pakistan for about six years. Uh, and we started from a very, very small startup with a warehouse, warehouse on a rooftop in Karachi. So basically from nothing when e-commerce didn't exist. And then uh, we've built the business uh, together with, uh, with the rest of the industry players and become an important part of Alibaba's also a global ecosystem. Um, so as part of this journey, uh, we've invested a lot, uh, primarily in tech infrastructure and education. Uh, these are core pillars of, of investment. And as part of this journey, we've, of course, seen illicit trade upfront uh, at, at all stages of the, of the development of the business. I think from, from Daraz's uh, point of view or from an e-commerce point of view, the key things that, that, uh, you know, that I would like to talk a bit about today is, is the cash-based economy and how that is uh, you know, a huge driver of, of inefficiencies in, uh, in, in uh, you know, creating a, a healthy market dynamic. Uh, also, how e-commerce is driving digitalization. We're working on a, on a study also together with the World Bank about how we can prove that e-commerce and digital, digitalization actually uh, not only helps people do e-commerce, but also helps them professionalize and grow their business in general. So I think this is a huge topic about how to move from cash to digitalization. And another topic which is incredibly important uh, for the market that, uh, that we will talk about today is uh, the, the huge amounts of smuggled goods that are coming into the, to the market, which is, uh, which is, of course, creating multiple problems. Uh, one is that uh, the government is not able to collect uh, taxes on, on these, uh, these goods. Uh, and the second is that it creates a very difficult market for legit sellers who are actually trying to do good business uh, and, and pay their taxes and work with official channels. So this discrepancy in the market definitely has to be leveled in order to, uh, to enable the future growth. Uh, and the third point that, that I uh, have on my list is, uh, is fraud, where I think e-commerce can actually be a, a very leading indicator because we are 
the first to digitalize the whole ecosystem, not just the RAS, but also our logistics partners. We, we've integrated directly with FBR, so they have direct access to all of our transactions from a tax perspective, uh, payment uh, channels, and, uh, and all other business partners and sellers as well. So this digitalization of the e-commerce ecosystem, I think, is a very good indicator for how we need to also uh, you know, optimize the, the broader economy. Uh, so I hope I can share some, uh, some some thoughts on the learnings that we've that we've gone through. So uh, overall, I just wanted to finish off with uh, the, the government. I think in, in general right now are taking all the right initiatives and they're putting the right effort behind them, which is really encouraging to see. Uh, I think there are two main risks uh, that maybe we can we can touch on today. I think one is uh, making sure that these solutions they don't become too complex and that they, they become too compromised. So a good initiative actually in the end doesn't solve the use case on the ground. That's a, that's a huge risk. And then the second risk is the discrepancy that we sometimes see as a business environment or a community where the government maybe has the right intentions, but what's happening on the ground is a very different reality. And that gap definitely needs to be bridged. Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll come back to those two risks and uh, give you an opportunity to expand on your thinking there. Um, so yeah, you hit on fraud, taxes, smuggled goods, cash economy, and digitalization. And I think those those will sort of thread throughout the conversation we have over the next hour. Uh, I wanted to give uh, Roman from PMI an opportunity to give his introductory remarks. Thank you, Chris. Uh, hello, everybody, and good afternoon to those connecting from Pakistan. I work for Philip Morris International. I had our business in Pakistan, a country in which we invested uh, quite heavily over 10 years ago, where we operate two manufacturing facilities. Um, I suppose, I mean, what I want to point out, perhaps two elements which could facilitate the discussion uh, and could be valid for most fast-moving consumer goods companies, but in the tobacco industry, the legitimate uh, tax-paying and, and uh, regulated industry is losing off to uh, the illicit trade um, every year, year on year, and that is uh, of a certain importance. Indeed, our Nielsen uh, from August 2020 states that illicit cigarettes are in the range of 40%. I believe that may be even an underestimate. So so the discussion matters. It matters to me, to us, and to the employees which we have working uh, with us in, in Pakistan. It matters even more if you try to quantify what is the loss, which according to Oxford Economics is in the range of uh, 44 billion rupees uh, every year. So that's not only a threat to the legitimate industry, it, it may be a threat to the economy, if not uh, to, to the state. My second point is, is positive, is definitely positive, because illicit trade is not at all unique to, to Pakistan. Many other countries had uh, large incidences, perhaps not of the same magnitude. But many, com many countries cooperating with companies all over the world have reduced that incidence. I, I remember Eastern Europe after the fall of communism, uh, how they got gradually legitimized uh, their businesses. Latin America has also good examples, and so does Europe. So I, my argument is that there is a recipe. There are certain ingredients. Uh, there's no silver bullet. But working all together, it, it won't be easy and it won't be short. It can be addressed. And, and I hope that together uh, with this discussion and The Economist, uh, this first discussion could be a catalyst for a positive change. So I'll stop there. OK, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Malik? Uh, from the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Pakistan Business Council, if you'd like to give some brief uh, introductory remarks. Okay, so good afternoon, good evening, uh, and thank you for, uh, for for having me on. Um, I want to let you start with a slightly different perspective. Um, whilst uh, the informal economy or the illicit economy is a major challenge, and, and, and I don't want to belittle that in any way, uh, I think the, the biggest sufferer of this is the common person of Pakistan. Um, you know, as a result of the paucity of resources, uh, the government does not have enough to invest behind the human capital development. Um, and it is through that light that I would like to look at uh, the challenge here. Uh, so very briefly, Pakistan Business Council is a business advocacy body. Uh, amongst the many things that we try to advocate are policies that would also promote formalization of the economy. But before joining Pakistan Business Council, I spent about a quarter of a century, about 24 years working for Unilever in multiple geographies, but nine of those years were heading the business in Pakistan. So I'm very acutely aware of the impact that uh, you know illicit trade has on, on, on businesses. Uh, 
But again, let's put things into a perspective. Um, the kind of returns that Unilever has enjoyed in Pakistan are significantly superior to the kind of returns that Unilever enjoys globally. That's point number one. And that is not, that's not specific to Unilever. It applies across uh, multiple uh, businesses. Um, I think the second point is that the rate of growth of these uh, MNCs in Pakistan is also about twice, if not uh, at an at a, at a even higher rate than the global growth rates. So despite all the challenges, the opportunities far outweigh the challenges. Now, when going back to the challenges, of course, as I, as I said earlier, we should not belittle them in any way. Uh, they're caused by a multiplicity of factors, one of which, of course, the most significant is high rate of taxation. Uh, and this, of course, manifests itself even greater when it comes to cigarettes. But even with a with a GST rate, uh, general sales rate of 17% is a huge incentive to evade. Uh, that coupled with the highly complex system of administering uh, the the uh, the you know tax collection, etc., also deter a lot of people in joining the formal sector. But there are a number of initiatives that are at play, and maybe you know, given an opportunity during the the rest of this session. Uh, we can, I can cover that. So I'll just stop at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Meanwhile, I'll follow up with uh, Mr. Malik first because you you have the uh, the last word in the introductory remarks. Um, so tax evasion, uh, you, you you spoke about a little bit. Um, how how can the government do a better job of combating that? Is it just lowering the tax rate? Uh, are there other are there other means of, of combating the tax evasion issue? Everybody mentioned this. Three three of you have spoken so far have mentioned taxes and tax evasion as being a, as an issue. So how how is that addressed? I, I think most of all, make it simpler for people to comply with the with the tax uh, regulations. Uh, the the regulations are highly complex. There are multiple taxes. There are provincial, first of all, there are local taxes, then there are provincial taxes, then there are national taxes. Uh, each of them require different sets of returns to be filed. Uh, they don't speak to each other. The systems don't speak to each other. So there's an opportunity to digitize or digitalize uh, the, uh, the, the filing of the returns. Uh, there are uh, the general sales tax rate, which is not only high, uh, is also levied at, at, by the provinces on the services, but on goods by the, by the federation. Uh, now, if I have a goods producer in province A, I need to recover the input tax uh, that I paid on the services in, in, in my province against the products that I've sold across country. Uh, that matching mechanism is weak and is often missing uh, and creates a lot of problems and deters me sometimes physically from uh, matching the two and, and, and claiming. So that's just uh, an example. So simplification, and of course, lower rates would definitely help because the greater to the incentive, um, the greater the incentive, uh, you know, the, uh, the the greater will be uh, the evasion. Um, so uh, I, I, I think it's, it, there's no one solution. Uh, there, there are a number of solutions. So shall I just stop because I see uh, uh, Dr. Ishaq, that is bad. Dr. Hussain, are you, are you back? Can you hear us? Yeah, I, I lost okay. all of you. I lost your voice. Okay. Well, we'll uh, we'll give you we'll give you a moment here if you'd like to take uh, if you'd like to give some introductory remarks about this issue. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, most of the issues which have been highlighted are quite right, but the problem is that we should not do you know cosmetic changes, but we should aim at deep rooted structural reforms. And one of the important things which we have done is that we have separated the tax policy and the tariff policy from the purview of the Federal Board of Revenue. You can't have a tax collecting agency also dictating the policies which are detrimental to the economic interests of the country. And that is the starting point because what they were doing is they were raising the rates of taxation and the tariff rates on those who were already honest taxpayers. So the documented sector, which was doing its job, 
was burdened heavily, and therefore there was a disincentive for anyone to come within the purview of the documentation sector. So what has happened now is that we have separated tax administration from tax policy and tariff policy. And the tariff policy and tax policies are now aimed at broadening the tax base and increase the number of the taxpayers who are evading the taxes. And it has two-pronged strategy. First, automation of the FBR processes so that the discretionary powers of the FBR officials in valuation of the goods and services, in declaration of the goods, and in giving favors to those who are misdeclaring their production, they are completely eliminated. And that, I think, will help a great deal. The other one is third-party data integration. As you know, Pakistan has a unique identifying number, the computerized national in identity card, which almost 75 to 80% of the adults carry. And then we have a whole optic fiber network and the broadband penetration, which is quite high. We are using that in order to integrate our databases from the third party in order to estimate as to how much evasion is taking place. And then through the automation processes, we would be chasing those people rather than the FBR officials. So these measures will actually help us. And I give you one example, I'll take a little bit more time, that mobile phones were 75% of them were coming through smuggled routes. By a technology-based solution called DRIPS, we have now completely eliminated the smuggling and the revenues of the mobile phones and the numbers have gone astronomically high. So we are trying to use the same method for other measures like the track and tracing for tobacco sector, for sugar sector, where there is a lot of illicit trade. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Hussain. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to you uh, momentarily. Um, Mr. Mickelson, you mentioned uh, moving away from cash-based society digitalization. Uh, I wonder if you could follow up on Dr. Hussein's remarks and how this would help address the issue with taxation. And the, I don't want to spend too much time. I, this isn't the Economist's uh, tax hour on Pakistan, but the first poll question, uh, the results were very clear. Tax evasion uh, was 70, received 70% 70 of the responses. So obviously this is a yeah. very important issue in Pakistan. Um, so I wonder if you could give your thoughts on, on what your firm is doing and how digitalization can help in this regard. Yeah, so, so first of all, I think, um, I think the, fixing the tax uh, uh, collection issue, I, wouldn't, I would even go further and, and, and question sometimes if it's called evasion, because for many years it was just the way it was, right? It's just that you, you either register your business or you don't. Now we need to educate people uh, that you know, registering your business is the right way to go. And, uh, and, and, and that's what we're trying to prove also with, with digitalization, to prove that if you do business, for example, in e-commerce, where you're very visible as a business, right? Everyone can see what you're selling at, what products you're selling, uh, what the name of your business is. Uh, all, all these things are readily available. So if you decide to come into the e-commerce ecosystem, then people um, need to also believe that there's a benefit of this, right? And that's what we're trying to, uh, that's what, what we're trying to develop. And we're making huge progress, right? Uh, this starts with, with education. So we developed uh, uh, our own university called the Raj University. It's an online university that we, where we partnered with the KSBL, one of the universities in Karachi, to actually give out diplomas. Right, so you can graduate from Daraz University and get a diploma that you're a certified e-commerce business. Th this is amazing, right? That that you can actually take an education online, and I can say in, in November alone we had more than sixty thousand users. So there's a huge demand and interest to really learn 
how to do legitimate, uh, legit business. Um, so I think education is a, is a huge part and basically proving the point that being uh, registered and doing legit business is actually something that pays. Right, so we have an, 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 uh, a responsibility as an e-commerce business to uh, to prove that this is also the case. Um, then I think the, the, in order to do that, we need all these things that uh, Dr. Hussein also talked about. Um, and I think I would just add to uh, to, to one of the points uh, that uh, was made by, by Mr. Malik that in order to do that, you need to have a, a national alignment between the different tax authorities. And it's not only that these are not integrated between the, the provincial and the federal tax uh, agencies, but it's also that they're actually competing, right? So they will often, they, they come to us and say, you need to pay tax in this way and on, on that revenue. And the province will say, no, you need to pay tax in a different way. And we're saying, we're fine to pay, but you need to agree where, where, how we should pay. It shouldn't, we shouldn't pay twice. Right. So I think there's a, there's a huge, the first step in order to fix this, uh, this belief in the digital economy is that, uh, that there needs to be alignment at a national level and some sort of standardization and clarity so that businesses, the business community, doesn't get caught in between competing tax agencies. This is, this is incredibly important. And then I think on, on the automation part that the, uh, Dr. Hussein also mentioned, I think here I would come back to my first risk uh, which is that, that the, the solutions, they become too complex. And I absolutely agree that uh, creating, uh, using the fact that every si single mobile phone has a unique identifier has completely cleaned up the, the gray channels and the smuggling that came in through phones, right? Uh, but but if, if we try and apply that to everything, for example, e-commerce products, where you need to track every single product and package, it, it will not work. We do tens of millions of, of packages uh, and, and, and orders uh, in, in, in the year. So, uh, so I think this is the first risk that, uh, that we shouldn't complexify. And uh, with regards to the automation, uh, the automation, uh, for example, we're, we're now integrated with FBR. So FBR has uh, a direct API with our system so they can see real time all of our orders. Right. And I also think this is a step too far. Uh, of course, the, the initiative is good that it's creating automation and it's creating visibility so that the, the tax authorities, they can see what's actually happening in the business community and they can find the, the people who are evading. But this is taking it a step too far because, I mean, in the end, we get audited. Our financial auditors are PwC. They go in and audit our systems and they, they sign an audited financial report. If we have the tax officer looking at tens of millions of individual transactions and trying to decide what should our taxes be on that basis, the whole system will crash. So I think um, I agree with everyone here, uh, all the points that have been mentioned, but I would just reiterate these risks of creating things that are too complex and too uh, micromanaged uh, versus the, the structural improvements about designing solid systems and processes uh, that, that can actually also solve the problem. I think this would be my, okay. my feedback from an e-commerce perspective. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions come, have come in. Mr. Yazbek, we'll get to you in a moment. But I wanted to follow up on that, on those points with uh, Mr. Malik and doc, Dr. Hussain. I guess I'll start with uh, Mr. Malik. Um, the local, provincial, and federal taxes and, and this situation that, uh, that Mr. Mickelson described, how, how does that get resolved? What's the solution? How do they get simplified? How do they get rationalized? What, what does your organization, the Pakistan Business Council, what, what are your recommendations? Okay, so the Pakistan Business Council's recommendations are, first of all, recognize the problem. Um, the problems are very real. Often, often the problems are, are ignored. Um, so listening to the taxpayers, I think, would be a great start. Uh, the, the second one is where an attempt has been made, uh, uh, you know, for example, between the Punjab, which is the largest province, and the center, they have been able to begin to rationalize their systems uh, and, and come to a, a common platform. Unfortunately, it is yet to happen with the other uh, provincial taxation authorities. Uh, I believe uh, uh, work is happening in Sindh, which is the second largest province. Uh, the others, other, other two will come along too. So, so I think recognize the issue, then look at the, look at the problems, uh, begin to, uh, to, to deal with them. Um, and I, I think that would be the way forward, frankly, in a very simple sort of uh, approach. Can I, can I add to this, please? 
Yes, of course. You. I was going to. I was going to go to you next, Doctor Hussain. Please. Yeah, I think. Uh, let me clarify that there is one particular area where there is some ambiguity, which is the GST on goods and GST on services. And the GST on goods is the exclusive domain of the Federal Board of Revenue, while GST on services is that of the provinces. So there is a clear demarcation. There are some overlapping areas, which are 10 to 15%, where the businesses do not know whether this falls under the federal or the provincial. So what the National Tax Policy Committee is doing, which is representative of all the uh, revenue authorities, is to create a national portal. And the taxpayer will just enter the claims which are supposed to be fulfilled under the provincial and the federal taxes. There will be only one form they have to fill in. At the back end, the system will then allocate whether it goes to Punjab, it goes to Sindh, or it goes to the federal government or KP. So that work is underway, and that will facilitate, as far as the front end is concerned, the lives of people who are doing the business. But that is something which is work underway. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for that. Can I make a comment um, here? Uh, sorry, who, who's speaking? Hey, it's, it's uh, Bianca here. Can I make uh, just oh, a yeah, quick yeah. remark on that? Just briefly, briefly, please. Very briefly, yeah. I think one thing additionally that I would really uh, encourage uh, is that we start, of course, a system that allocates automatically is great. Uh, in the meantime, I would just encourage that the, um, the, the different chairmen of the provinces and the FBR are able to meet, that we've many times sent out invitations and said, let's just agree, you know, between us on some principles. Because uh, because uh, the law is, is uh, open to interpretation, and uh, until that happens, I think we will be pulled in different directions. So the system is the long-term solution. In the meantime, just bring people to the table, like it happened also for the telco industry some some years ago, where uh, they managed to bring people to to the to the same table and then agree on some principles of allocation of taxes. I think this would really be a, a helpful start, uh, particularly for e-commerce. Okay, well, hopefully this uh, hopefully this event has brought uh, brought the two sides together at least to start uh, on that issue. Um, Mr. Hasback, you've been very quiet. I apologize. We've taken a circuitous route to get back to you. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a chance to make some brief remarks on the taxation, but there is a um, there is a question directed towards you on track and trace. So if you'd like to say something about taxes, I'll give you a moment to do that, and then we'll uh, move on to te track and trace. Sure, sure. Thanks, Chris. Uh, look, on on on, on taxes, uh, I, I just hope that the, the institutions look at pricing the way uh, companies do. And once the uh, price of the legitimate product is 1% or 200% higher than the one of the illicit product, you lose the battle, and 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 I would invite the authorities to, to look at that. It, it's simple economics because the driver, the driver is profit, uh, and 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 as long as there be such an immense margin between uh, being a legitimate operator and being an illegitimate operator, uh, it's going to be pushing water uh, uphill. Uh, going on the solutions because we don't have to get into a tax discussion. We will in June with the with the tax bill. Uh, I was mentioning earlier on uh, that there is a recipe, and, and track and tracing system has proven to be quite effective uh, and is implemented in most countries. So those are fiscal stamps that recognize every single pack and shipping case, and those help not only in addressing what is the legitimate production, but also tracking and tracing and finding out uh, the roots uh, of illicit trade. Uh, um, I know that the institutions are currently looking into implementing it. It's not the first time. I hope this time it will uh, go through. I hope it also is kept very simple and low cost because they don't need to be particularly sophisticated and they will help. Track and trace cannot work on its own. 
you need a system of inspectors on the territory, you need a wise fiscal policy, you need to use digital technology, and you need to cooperate between the industries, the legitimate industries, and the institutions. Cooperating is not only important, I think it's vital, and that's what we do. Uh, because, sadly, uh, fighting illicit trade is my first business priority. As I said, mentioned, as I mentioned earlier on, almost half of the market is illicit. Uh, so cooperation in this sense, on, in many countries, we teach the inspectors how to recognize a, a counterfeit product. We support the customs with scanning devices for the merchandise. Uh, we have supported awareness campaign to address what uh, Mr. Malik said. I mean, there is a cultural problem in which the, the, the illicit, if you go into an open market, is normalized. Once retailers display it with pride, they're, they're very low prices and consumers accept it. There is a, a, a cultural element which, which uh, we have to touch upon. An awareness campaign on saying that had the government collected the 44 billion rupees this year, you could have built roads, hospital infrastructure. There is also a cultural element, and, and I agree with what Mr. Miller. So you need a 360 degrees policy and, and many actors and it should start uh, with sharing of information and looking at what other countries think. Uh, I, I do praise what the government is trying to do. Uh, I believe it's it's too little. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a bunch of questions that are coming in, uh, uh, but I do want to ask the next poll question to the audience. Uh, and while we're waiting for the results to come in, I'll I'll send some questions. I'll ask some questions of the uh, panelists. The next poll question is. To reduce illicit trade, governments must prioritize, and then there is a list of uh, six or seven, um, six or seven options. Uh, you can only select one, and that's important uh, because, in my experience, uh, talking about illicit trade, uh, people tend to say, "Well, we need to collaborate. There needs to be better enforcement. We need to collect taxes. We need to reform the tax system." Uh, I, I think the, the key to this question is you, what is the main priority? All of those things I think um, I think the panelists would agree are important, uh, but governments and law enforcement can't do everything at once, so there has to be a priority. So we'll wait for that to come in. And while we're doing so, one question we have for Dr. Hussein is um, there are estimates that the uh, informal, illicit, or parallel economy is the same size as the illicit or legitimate economy in Pakistan. Do you believe that to be the case? And if so, why is it that large? Um, I imagine taxation is going to be part of that answer, but uh, what, what else is involved, Dr. Hussein? Well, the estimates vary. Uh, there have been studies which show it was 30%. Some studies show it is 50%. So I don't know which one is correct, but it is true that informal sec uh, sector uh, is quite vibrant. But you should also realize that 40% of the workforce is employed in agriculture sector. And agriculture sector is not at all formal. It is all informal sector. The taxation, for example, on agriculture doesn't exist at all. So if you are an agriculturist, you are exempt from income tax because agriculture income tax is paid to the provinces, which is a minuscule of what the non-agriculture income. So then the retail trade is in the hands of the small you know, vendors, small shopkeepers, mom and uh, pop uh, stores, and they provide employment, and they are outside the purview of the formal uh, economy. So if you take agriculture and the retail trade, these two elements, that is a very significant portion of the entire economy. But the employment intensity of the informal sector is twice or thrice as high because they are not governed by minimum wages, they are not governed by the social security contributions, they are not governed by the employment old uh, age benefit. So the burden, besides the taxation, on the informal sector is minimal. 
and therefore they are able to generate a lot of employment which increases the aggregate demand in the economy and the aggregate demand in the economy then goes to the formal sector and the purchasing of the from the formal sector then generates higher level of economic activity which comes back to the taxation so that is the cycle which derives the informal economy into the integration with the formal economy mm, okay okay thank you for that we have a uh, uh we have the survey results in but uh before i announce those uh we do have a, a question for uh mr mickelson uh and this sort of returns us back to your uh, opening remarks. Uh, and one of the things you did mention was uh, smuggled goods. Uh, and the question is, what measures is Duraz taking to uh, estimate the flow of these, uh, these products and to um, uh, discourage their trade? Yeah, so I think first of all, I would I would like to use the example of mobile phones that uh, Dr. Hussein talked about before. That in the past, when we started six years ago, a huge part of the market, maybe half of the market, maybe more, was was smuggled phones. So how do you come in as an e-commerce business and and try to make a business where people can sell on your platform? But there are some uh, people who haven't uh, paid their taxes and they can sell at a cheaper price. So why would you buy at a higher price, uh, you know, for, for the legitimate business? So in the end, this, the solution uh, is, is that, that we need to clean up the, the smuggled goods, right? <laughs> and um, and that's, that's what the government has, gone, has done. And we took a very, very early on, we took a very tough business stance that we said, even before all this, this uh, cleanup happened, we said, we will not work with uh, with with uh, with sellers who were selling smuggled mobile phones, for example. And then, because we want to be known as the RAS as a place where people trust that we will deliver the you know the legitimate uh, product uh, with a good quality and a good service. Uh, then, of course, the, the the challenge is always when you operate as a marketplace. Um, there, we have uh, thirty thousand active sellers in a in a normal month. Uh, there will always be people who are trying to list products and, and trying to do things that they're not supposed to do. So I think one thing is you need to decide as a business, you know, do you want to take the tough route and then say we work with the legitimate part of the market and then believe that that's the right long-term strategy? So that's one thing we did early on, which of course hurt us in the short term, but I think has helped us in the in the long term. Uh, the second is that we, we work very, very, um, uh, I would say, uh, dedicatedly to uh, to to uh, do fraud prevention and and this is one thing we've learned a lot from alibaba uh, our, our shareholder uh, about using algorithms and uh, and ai and machine learning to basically prevent people from listing uh, products that for example have price discrepancies you can see that this is not a price that's in line with the market it can be picture uh, discrepancies we can scan the images and see if this is some, if something that doesn't look right or it can be search uh, key, keywords or it can be the text uh, or something that doesn't match and to give you a statistic, every single day we block uh, about 1,200 products from being listed on the platform because of our uh, fraud prevention tools. Uh, so using these algorithms and technology in order to try and keep the, the, the quote-unquote bad sellers uh, off the platform is, uh, is, is incredibly important. So I think from, a, from an e-commerce perspective, it's about using your data and your technology, but it's also about making a fundamental business decision. Where do you want to be positioned in the market? Okay. I hope that answers yeah. the question. So the uh, the uh, the most uh, the most popular response to the second poll question was, uh, in fact, investment in uh, technological solution and or tools uh, to improve monitoring uh, or enfor and or enforcement. Um, but the the second most popular was enforcement, um, and there needs to be an enforcement of existing laws, uh, Mr. Mr. Malik, I think I'll, I'll, I'll point, uh, I'll direct this to, to you. Um, it seems to suggest that there are laws on the books already that would help to combat the issue of illicit trade. Uh, they're just not being enforced. Uh, would, you, would you agree with that view and what needs to be done on the enforcement side of this equation? 
Yep, okay, so I, I think that's right. Uh, the laws are very strong on paper. Uh, unfortunately, in application, they, are, they don't really work out. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, I mean, take, take the law on counterfeiting, for example. Um, when I returned back to Pakistan, having spent uh, you know, about 14, 15 years working abroad, uh, in the very first raid where we discovered that somebody had counterfeited a brand uh, of soap, um, in front of the magistrate, uh, you know, I, 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 I happened to be in the court, and the magistrate turned around to me and said, well, what gives you the God-given right to, uh, to market products under this particular brand? Hasn't this poor man uh, who you caught, um, you know, infringing your brand, hasn't he got the right to make a, a living? So, so it starts from a poor knowledge, even of the judiciary. Um, then even if the judiciary can be educated to some extent, it is a question of getting the public prosecutor to prosecute in an effective manner. Now, all these are criminal cases. So the brand owner is not able to hire a private prosecutor uh, and is at the mercy uh, of the competence or or, or, or other uh, you know uh, sort of uh, um, you know ways that uh, the public prosecutors unfortunately work, um, and therefore find that most of the people who are caught infringing are let go. Right, there are very few prosecutions that go to the end. Uh, 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 you know that, that that the trial takes place. So so that 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 is a fundamental weakness. I want to actually very quickly touch on one other topic uh, which nobody has covered so far. Um, one of the things that Pakistan has suffered significantly from is the misuse of the transit treaty uh, uh, under which goods are allowed to move duty free through Pakistan into Afghanistan, which, as you know, is a land landlocked country. Um, so a lot of goods that are never meant to be used in Afghanistan, there's actually no demand for them. I'll give you a, a, a simple example, tea. Uh, in Afghanistan, people prefer to drink green tea, yet significant quantity of black tea is ostensibly imported for Afghanistan, but it is actually consumed in Pakistan. Right, and and, and what, what provides the incentive for that? There's actually a, an import duty, which is 10%, which is relatively high, but it's not very high, but there's a GST of 17% on the final consumer price, right? So, so there's a huge incentive to evade. Um, so, but the good news here, um, you know, we've been criticizing, um, but the good news is that the Afghan transit treaty lapsed, uh, has expired and is now being renegotiated. And Pakistan Business Council has been doing its limited handholding uh, of the government uh, and then trying to, uh, to guide them on how to go about it. And our proposals are very simple. We are saying only uh, have a quantitative check. Uh, in other words, only allow enough quantity to go into Afghanistan where there is actually a demand, right? So, and secondly, a qualitative check. So if they don't drink black tea, please don't allow black tea to go through Pakistan, because it's never going to leave Pakistan, it will be consumed in Pakistan. So these are two simple steps that the government is now adopting in renegotiating uh, that, that particular treaty. Okay, thank, thank you. you for that. Uh, I have a question that's come in for Dr. Hussein, but Dr. Hussein, if you could just wait a mo moment, I want to uh, ask Mr. Uh, Mr. Yazbek uh, to follow up on the enforcement issue, uh, and also if, if um, the transit issue is a uh, is a concern for PMI and illicit tobacco. Yeah, look, I, I can only agree with Mr. Malik on, on on the enforcement element. What I would like to suggest is a business perspective also to this, uh, because the driver and the root cause is profit, and I think there's could be a lot of return on investment by the state if they were to deploy a territory uh, force uh, which is well trained and equipped. Uh, to bring back all that uh, uh, money which is uh, evaded. So enforcement plays a big role, especially in conjunction with track and tracing, which is, I, I, I suppose, the answer to, to, to the survey. Um, with respect to the other element, um, unlike many other countries, uh, the issue in Pakistan is mostly uh, about local manufacturers, which under uh, declare their production. So local manufacturing, uh, under declaring is bigger uh, in our view than what is uh, transnational. Uh, this makes it in a way uh, more serious, but hopefully 
uh, perhaps more addressable because they are in your territory and there's no particular excuse about info. And, and, and so the problem is mostly internal. Okay, thank you. Dr. Hussain, just one second. Uh, I wanna ask the uh, last poll question uh, before we, we go into the last 15 minutes. And I think this is probably a record for all of the events I've done over the last couple of months, but we've, we've taken 45 minutes to get to the pandemic and to mention the coronavirus. Uh, nobody has done it so far. So congratulations, gentlemen. Uh, I, I, I do think that's a record for any of our events. Um, so the last poll question is, how worried are you about the potential for criminals to exploit the government's focus on combating the COVID pandemic uh, to expand their illicit enterprises further? Uh, and there's a scale of how worried you are from very worried to not at all worried. So while we're waiting though, for those to come in, uh, Dr. Hussain, uh, we have a question <clears throat> uh, that I'm particularly interested in, um, uh, having worked on illicit trade for the last four or five years, uh, and it doesn't get a lot of attention. And that's because I do also work on illicit trade, uh, is under, under, under invoicing as a means of money laundering. Um, and how rampant that is in Pakistan and what can be done to combat this version of fraud? Well, very good question. But before I answer your question, I'd like to give you some data because people talk in generality. Under the Afghanistan transit trade, we have started electronic tracking of transit containers from the port to Afghanistan and back and scanning on the border posts. That has resulted in the drop of the five major smuggling prone items from $800 million in 2019 to $59 billion in 2020, almost half of the illicit trade which was going in and coming back from Afghanistan transit trade has disappeared. And the official imports of those goods have actually doubled, and therefore our revenues have also gone up. So the, the, the technological solution, along with enforcement, they go hand to hand together, and that has shown the results as far as the Afghanistan transit trade is concerned which is what being one of the five, major... What are, saying, what are those five items? Tea has already been mentioned. I imagine tobacco... Black tea, black tea green tea, tires, textile pro products, and electronic goods. These were okay. the five smuggled prone. And they were creating havoc for our old domestic industry. And today you talk to any one of these industries, they're quite happy because their official production and imports have actually doubled. So that is what enforcement and technological solution uh, do together. Now, you raise a very interesting point and very important from our point of view under invoicing. And I illustrate again with the data because I'm an empirical economist. China used to send us goods from China, which were recorded as exports from China. And they came in as imports from China in our books. Four years ago, the discrepancy between the two data points was $4 billion. So they were showing that $4 billion goods have come into Pakistan, while we were showing that these goods worth $4 billion didn't appear because these are under invoicing. So what we have done is electronic data exchange with China. And today the discrepancy between the Chinese imports and Chinese exports has come down to 660 million from $4 billion, while the trade volumes have increased. So again, under invoicing can take place. Now we are negotiating with Dubai, which is the second point where under invoicing takes place. And we are negotiating with the Dubai government for electronic data exchange. So as soon as the goods leave and the value which the importer has declared, the same value will now be charged as far as the text is concerned when they arrive in Pakistan. So that is the answer to your 
question on how we are combating the under invoicing. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, before I get to the, the poll question results, is there, are there any of the other three panelists want to, uh, want to weigh in on the under invoicing issue? I don't know, uh, Mr. Mickelson, if this is an issue with the, you're an e-commerce platform or Mr. Malik with the business council, or I'm not sure this is a huge issue for PMI, but uh, if anybody else wants to stick their hand up and weigh in, I'm, I'm happy to take your input on this. Can I go? Yes. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You go first. Uh, Mr. Malik, why don't you go first? Okay. All right. So, so, so actually, the under invoicing issue was even larger than the four billion uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Ishwar just mentioned. Um, it has definitely come down, uh, and EDI is is really uh, the way forward. And I think UAE is, I think, the, the second largest sort of, for want of a better term, culprit here. Uh, we're between friends, right? Um, so, um, so I, I think there that, that would definitely uh, help. Um, on on the Afghan transit treaty, you know, just as innovative as we may be, uh, the uh, the the individuals who are actually trying to take advantage of that are also very innovative. A lot of the stuff has stopped coming through Pakistan, but has started going or had started going through the Char Bahar port. Uh, which is adjacent to the Pakistan border. So it travels through uh, Iran into Afghanistan and then unfortunately comes back to Pakistan. Uh, the, the, the tracking mechanism is very efficient in terms of monitoring what, uh, you know, the, the container movement out from the Pakistani port up to the uh, Afghan border. Uh, what unfortunately happens then is that the uh, container is opened um, but without being de-stuffed, is um, closed back again, and the truck takes a U-turn, and that comes back again. Um, so unfortunately, you know, as innovative as the technology and, and as we may be, the, the individuals who are trying to evade are also very innovative, and, and, they, and, they, and they find ways. Uh, so thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mickelson, you had your hand up, so I'll let you, uh, let you weigh in here as well. Yeah, I think this is a this is very relevant to the point on the under declared imports from from China. So, uh, so of course, as an e-commerce business, we do both. Our primary business is enabling local sellers to connect with with local local buyers. But there is a, a, also a big cross border e-commerce market, uh, and for us, this is very difficult to participate in because a, a number of the the international e-commerce businesses that are already where you can you can use your credit card and then you can pay on Amazon, for example. The money goes straight out of uh, through the gateway out of Pakistan, and then the the product comes in, and that can be under invoiced or uh, or even marked as a gift and, and and just not not be declared at all. So uh, so so this is a this is also a huge topic for for e-commerce. And what we've been advocating uh, is is to really level the playing field, make sure that there is uh, an efficient uh, customs network, and that there is uh, that things are digitalized, so that there's a. I know the government is working on a on a project called National Single Window, which is, uh, I, I believe is due to be launched in 2023, that it does three-way matching between the tax authorities, the customs authorities, and then the, the merchant data. Uh, so this is a good project to kind of level the playing field. Um, I think in, in the long term, it'll, it'll work. Um, and I, I know in the, as, as the most recent update, uh, there was a de minimis value that was, uh, that was announced by the government. So goods below 5,000 rupees can actually be sent into the country uh, as individual packages uh, without any customs. So this is a good start. I think it's great. Uh, but the problem is that 2023 is a long way away. And now taking, for example, this uh, de minimis value um, uh, and actually making it work operationally on the ground will be a big challenge. And here I would love to offer our services to the to the government, uh, <laughs> you know, to, to help design the solution. Uh, we've already sent a lot of uh, wireframes and, and, and diagrams to, to, to suggest how this could actually work in practice. Okay, I'll allow you that one bit of advertising and that's it. Uh, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, so we've only got five minutes left here. I'd like all of you to have a chance to, to have a last word. Uh, Mr. Yazbek, I'll start with you and with the um, with the survey results. Uh, somewhat unsurprisingly, uh, nearly forty percent of the uh, uh, of the audience said that they're very worried that the government's response to the pandemic uh, is going to allow 
uh, illicit enterprises to expand. Um, what's your view on this issue? And if you have uh, very brief, uh, any sort of last you'd like to give? Okay, no, very briefly. Um, yeah, it is a concern, and, and I believe that the pandemic exacerbates pre existing conditions and takes away the focus of the institution, understandably so. Uh, we have always to keep in mind who we are competing with. Um, organized crime and criminal organizations uh, are very fast. They, they, they mutate, uh, they, they morph into other things. I saw it in April when sanitizers were fake. Uh, that was very, very fast uh, in Karachi. So we have to keep in mind that they're, they're, they have enormous speed. They're faster than companies and certainly faster than, than institutions. That's why we have to look into uh, technology, digitalization, and cooperation to fill in that uh, that gap. And 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 what what I truly hope for is a permanent, as we call it, a technical table, in which all the operators uh, and players sit around a table and 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 don't talk politics, but talk about possible tools, solutions, cooperation, uh, and we will get there. Yeah. Okay, great, Mr. Malik. Uh, so any closing remarks you'd like to give? You might be on mute, sir. Sorry, okay. Uh, I was gonna say that the political will in Pakistan to enforce has relatively been weak over the years. This particular government is very determined uh, to, 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 to ensure that, uh, you know, evasion goes down, smuggling goes down, et cetera, et cetera. COVID actually, one positive that it brought was that the, because there were fewer people traveling and a lot of goods come with people when they travel, um, you know, smuggling of uh, personal products and of uh, food items like cheese, et cetera, uh, went down significantly. So that could be taken as <laughs> to being a positive, I don't know. Um, but having having said that, I think one other uh, fundamental uh, change that has happened, which has coincided um, uh, at the, the same time as COVID, it has been the FATF. So Pakistan has become very conscious and very determined to enforce uh, the full compliance, uh, you know, uh, set of uh, requirements for FATF. And you know, the surest way to to quell a, a lot of evasion and a lot of smuggling, etc., um, is to control the financial flows because somehow under invoicing has to be paid for, right? Uh, but if you are able to formalize the flow of money you effectively uh, restrict the uh, the growth of the informal sector. So that, that's, that's very, very important. So I think that's happened at this time. Great. Uh, Dr. Hussein, I'm gonna give you the last word, but before we get to you, Mr. Mickelson, 30 seconds, any, any sort of closing remarks that you'd like to give before we wrap this up? Yeah, I just I just uh, would like to say that I think this uh, this discussion has been incredibly helpful and uh, and I'm even more optimistic about the initiatives that are happening in the country. So I would just like to reiterate my two uh, risks uh, for for everyone to remember. So number one is not over complexifying the solutions and remembering that the users in the end they also need to uh, to make it work on the on the ground. Uh, and secondly, uh, we need to do more about the disconnect between the good government intentions and then the very different experience from the business community on the ground. I think those are the two Great. key points that I would uh, end with. Very uh, succinct. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hussein, uh, you've got about 30 or 45 seconds. If uh, you'd like to okay. give some closing remarks, please. Let me, let me um, convey through you and this forum that the government and Personally, the prime minister is very open in his dialogue with the business community. He meets every sector almost a month or fortnightly, and he listens to them, and then he gives direction to the FBR, to the customs, to the others. So our doors are quite open. We don't have the monopoly of wisdom. We learn from the stakeholders. So the idea that we are doing things on our own, that's not right. We have consultative bodies. We have absolute regular interaction. Today, the prime minister is in Sialkot, which is the largest exporting you know, city of Pakistan, and he's telling them as to what they can do in order to help the government to increase exports and what the government can do 
to increase the export. So this is a business-friendly government which is trying to help take off. And we need the help and cooperation of everyone. And therefore, I appreciate the economists for organizing this discussion in which I learned a lot from the other participants. Well, and we appreciate you for joining us uh, and for the other three panelists uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, and also, we want to thank uh, Philip Morris for sponsoring another virtual event in the illicit trade series. So I think with that, we've gone over just a little bit, and I will wrap it up. And uh, once again, thank the panelists and thank, thank everyone who has um, attended this evening. Uh, this session will be available for viewing afterwards, so there will be a recording. Uh, if some of your colleagues couldn't attend and you'd like them to watch it, then uh, it'll be uh, available to share. Uh, and we will be hosting, excuse me, similar events in the coming weeks and months on sustainability, supply chains, and a host of other issues. And you can uh, find out about those at events.economist.com. Once again, I'm Chris Clegg, Managing Editor with the EIU, and thank you for all attending, and uh, I think we'll close the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.